Well, would you believe it? Another Magnavox ZV427MG9. And I believe the only complaint on this one is the fan is noisy. So these do have a cooling fan in the back of the unit, which I believe is mainly used for cooling the DVD drive during the recording process. But anytime you have this thing powered on, the fan does run. Uh, this one does have the HDMI output. Some of the later models did not. They cut back on that to save 18 cents or 23 cents. I'm not sure. But anyhow, let's go ahead and take a look at this unit. You can tell it has been used. It definitely does have uh, a little bit of dirt and build up on it. I'll, I'll hit that with a, a nice little rag and some glass cleaner before we get too terribly far. Let's get the top off and look inside before I actually power this thing up to see if I see anything with a visual inspection. Well, okay, there's the inside view of the unit. And the first thing I see is it has an appointment with the shop vac to get some of this dust out of here. It is definitely a tad bit dusty. Uh, let's try to spin the fan. The span, fan spins okay. Let me see if I can flip this up a little bit. Physically, the fan feels okay, but who knows about when we actually get it powered up, what will happen. Let's just go ahead and power this thing up before I do anything, because I, I don't want to like spin it and blow a piece of fuzz out of it. That might be the whole problem. Okay, here we go. AC power has been applied. And the fan does run, and it is fairly quiet. I have dashes in the display, which means the power supply capacitor is good. Power the unit on. It makes a little bit of noise, but it's not too terribly bad. Let me get the microphone off here. It's definitely not the worst one I've ever heard. Okay, well, uh, I don't even want to try to put a tape or a DVD in this unit before I uh, get some of the dust out of here. Although it does look like... Oh, uh-oh. Well, that has not been used in two and three-quarter days because uh, it, the bearings were froze up, but now they're freed up. And as I'm spinning this, I don't know if you can make it out on the camera or not, let me zoom in on it and get it repositioned over here. It has been in one position for a long time. If you look at the amount of dust on the reflective surface right there, you can see it's very dirty on one side. So I think I'm going to go ahead and blow this thing out uh, before I go any further. And this, look at that, that's the dust that's actually blowing out of the fan right there. So. Yeah, let's go ahead and just give this thing a you-know-what. Okay, so it is considerably cleaner than when we started. Did use the shot back in the blower mode to shh, blow the dust out. Never had problems with that in the past. So let's go ahead and apply AC power. Yeah, I did hear the fan come on. We'll turn the power on. Yes, the fan is noisy at this point. I believe the dust was keeping it quiet. Okay, take a listen to this. Yeah, not good. <laughs> it's like rum, 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 rum. Okay, so let's check out the rest of the unit. And uh, hopefully I have a fan I can pop in there easily. If not, I will have to order a fan for this unit. So first, I want to go ahead and check the DVD side, at least in playback, to make sure that it does play. We get my capture device set up here. Okay, opening the drawer. And it does not wish to open. Huh. 
Come on, baby, you can do it. Okay, well, we had to manually open it. Let's see if it will even attempt to read the disc. It shows that it's reading. I do hear something. I got my beeps that I needed from the optical drive. But yeah, that fan, it, it's, it's noisy. Well, so far, so good. It looks like it's actually going to read the disc. It's making all the right sounds. And it did actually read the disc. Okay, let's go ahead and just play this one track that's on there. And yeah, look at that. It is actually playing. Turn the volume down on my monitor. Okay, well that is a very good sign that it actually does play a DVD. Next we'll go ahead and see if the VCR actually works. So I'm gonna stop the DVD. I will switch it over to the VCR mode and we're just going to grab a tape that if it does get eaten, it really wouldn't matter anyhow. All right, so what I want to see is the tape to go in, the tape to sit down and everything come to a stop for about one to two tenths of a second. Then the cylinder should spin up and then it should begin loading the tape. If the tape just goes in and sets down and it loads the tape, then I know it's got a bad mode select switch, most likely. And it doesn't even go down. It's hanging up on something. And immediately I see what it's hanging up on. The back tension arm is bent out of the way here. So I'm just going to try to manually straighten it up. And that looks pretty doggone good. Let's see what's gonna happen this time. It took it in. It's down completely. It paused. And I don't, I don't think the tab's out of this tape, so I'm gonna have to, no, it just shut down. and it's not taking up the tape. And it will not give the tape back. Okay. Well, that's certainly good. And the machine completely powered off. I've got no signal on the capture device. And it will not let me do a thing. Enter, oh, there it goes. It's gonna to try to reload which is not a good thing. I'm just gonna ask it to eject. And it's not taking the tape up again. And I'm trying to manually roll the loading motor over here. Huh, well that's definitely a different scenario than I'm used to. So the DVD drive is doing something, but I still have no video on the screen. It just says no signal. And that's the capture device that puts that up when it can't detect a signal. And well, look at that, powered it up, it sucked the tape in, which is a good thing. And then it shut down, power back on. Okay, now you give the tape back. Okay, thank you. Oh, let's try it one more time. Loading. Still loading. Belt is slipping, which might be half the problem right there. And power down. Okay, let's, uh, let's try to just clean the belt first. It feels like it has adequate tension. It doesn't feel like it's super slacked. So hopefully if I power this on, it will unload. and eject. Still could be a dirty mode select switch because if it doesn't know it's at the end of the loading cycle, it's going to continue to load and load and load. 
Okay, one moment while I pop this belt off. It uh, really doesn't require any special tools or anything. You just gotta uh, pop it off the pulley here on the top. And then you can finagle it around the, uh, the supply sensor right here and get it off that bottom pulley. All right, one moment and we'll hit it with some acetone. The uh, YouTube comment generator. Well, as you can certainly see, it's been sitting in the same position for a day and three quarters, maybe even up to two days. So let's put this out of the way and I'll get a paper towel, soak it with acetone and we'll give this thing the acetone treatment. Okay, I've got a paper towel. You can see it is soaked with acetone right there. Like I said, the YouTube comment generator. It's gonna be fine. Only been doing this for 40 plus years so yeah it's it's what it is so this is going to remove contaminants from the belt like that basically i just fold the paper towel over it and i pull the belt through it repeatedly and as you can see i rotate it while i'm pulling it so i basically i can only apply pressure to two sides so if i rotate it i get the other two sides of the belt and uh, look at that just brushing against the belt and so all I'm doing is taking my acetone and just dumping it out right there onto the paper towel and it definitely is uh, deglazing the belt they get a glaze on them that is very slippery over time and I kind of want to keep doing this until the belt comes out fairly clean, which is normally four or five cycles here. Back in the 80s and 90s, every shop rag we had had these marks on it from cleaning belts at the shop I worked at, both in Northern and in Southern California. Yeah, definitely liking, a lot, liking that a lot better, much less coming off every time. And I think I'm going to call that good. You can definitely see the difference between the first cleaning, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth cleaning. It feels much better. And just, I'm going to wipe off any dust off of the workbench. Next, I'm going to move this back into place where you can see it. And I'm going to zoom in just a little bit. I'm going to offset it over here a tad because I really want to focus on that bottom pulley that you can barely see down there and that motor pulley. We're going to clean that as well. So cotton swab soaked with acetone. When you're serious about it, you soak it. When you're less serious, you just moisten it. I want to clean the pulley. I know you can't see what I'm doing. I'm sorry about that, but yeah, it wasn't too terribly bad. So other end of the cotton swab soaked with acetone. And this one is a little harder to get because it's down low. And I just want to clean the pulley. I don't know if you can see what I'm doing. I hope that you can. So I'm just basically wiping the groove with the cotton swab and rotating it with my other finger. Got a little bit of stuff out of there. Not too terribly bad. You can see a little contamination on the motor end. Uh, next, let's put the belt back on it. Sometimes it needs special tools to help get it oriented down here. It's just a matter of getting it up under the pulley more than anything. 
and then get it back on the motor pulley. Make sure you snap it underneath that infrared receiver right there. And oh, look at that, it's all lined up perfect. Okay, well, time for another try. Let's get the VCR mechanism back into view here. We'll zoom out just a little tiny bit and I'll try to offset it just a bit so you can actually see the motor as it's running. And uh, you know what, let's go ahead and I'll grab a Sharpie and I'll just put a mark basically on one half of the motor pulley. So as it's turning, you'll be able to see it change from black to white, white to black. Okay, here we go. Power has been applied. It should try to reset itself. Power on. And I do see something on the screen. We're in the DVD mode, switching it to the VCR mode. And here we go. Let's try to pop a tape into it. And it's still trying to load. And it should not be trying to load at this point. It shouldn't even be trying to play. So I do think that we have a contaminated mode select switch that we need to address before we go any farther on this unit if we want to get the VCR up and running. Power back on. It should try to rehome itself. You know what, this is just gonna be an in interesting test. I'm going to try just to run this multiple times and see if it cleans the mode select switch on its own, which has happened in the past. And it did, look at that. Play. And it's actually playing. So that confirms that it has bad contacts in the mode select switch and obviously a dirty real rotation sensor because it shut down. Power back on. Tape going back in. And it's still trying to load. You see that right there? So it didn't, didn't work that time. Power off, power on. A lot of times you can save these things just by using them. Letting them set is one of the worst things you can do, especially on the mechanical contacts and the mode select switch. It lets them get severely oxidized. And see that time it found itself fine. We'll hit play. It should play about seven seconds and then try to shut down. And it's playing, but I'm not getting video for some reason. And then it shut down because it timed out. Well, I think I can definitively say that it at least needs a mode select switch servicing. And there it is playing again. And it should shut down in about seven seconds because it's not detecting real rotation. Let's see if it'll fast forward. Power back on. It's going to try to eject. We'll put the tape back in it. Now it's not spilling the tape because if you look at the real rotation, the take up reel, it is actually taking up the tape. So fast forward. And it's the brake is not releasing. Well, it may have stopped in the wrong position. This will be a fun video. It's going to reject. I'm going to put the tape back in it. I wish it would just keep the tape so I didn't have to keep putting it in, taking it out, putting it in. Now, interesting. It's not releasing the brake at all. Well, that could be a problem we have to address. Okay, let's go ahead and get the mechanism out of this and at least get the VCR part squared away over here on this side before we tackle the DVD. We'll need to check the caps on it 
and I guarantee you it's going to need an optical pickup cleaning. Uh, and then we'll try a record test. I'm going to have to look around and see. I know I have one of these fans somewhere. Uh, I may have a used one with low hours that I can just donate to the customer. But uh, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. So next thing we're going to do is gut this unit. I need to remove the DVD mechanism. Always remember, do not unplug this connector right here unless absolutely necessary and you've taken the appropriate ESD static discharge precautions because that is the optical pickup. So I always try to leave this connected even if I'm changing caps. I just fold the board back over here. These two can be removed, no problem whatsoever. Uh, this one can be removed as well, but try to keep that one intact because it does have uh, discharge, either resistors or capacitors to keep the ESD static at a minimum over here. So pull the mechanism out. We're going to have to pull the power supply out, which lives down under the DVD mechanism. The back panel's got to be removed. Uh, and then uh, let's see, front panel's got to come off. The cross brace right here has got to come off. And then we can actually start unscrewing the mechanism and the circuit board. They come together. They come out together as a whole. And then, uh, yeah, we can disassemble the mechanism or get it up to clean the mode select switch at least. Well, I just wanted to remind you as you're disassembling this unit, when you get the front off, be very, very careful because it does have a single ribbon connector right here that does connect the front video input jacks to the circuit board. So let's take off this cross brace and take a look at this. Even after I blew this thing out, I mean, really, really good. Uh, there's still a crap ton of fuzz in there. And then take a look at the front of the mechanism. There is just a lot of fuzz just kind of hanging out here and there. So yeah, especially like underneath uh, the DVD mechanism, there's fuzz trapped on the grease. So I'm gonna take this back outside and blow it off once again as I'm disassembling this unit. All right, so there is the mechanism out of the unit completely. So just gonna flip this thing over to get to the bottom of it right here. And there's two screws I need to remove. So I'm just gonna use manual power tools here or a cordless screwdriver as it may be. So remember this side is going to be the machine thread side with a very fine thread. And then up under this ribbon cable that you need to be extremely careful about, you'll find another screw. Now this is gonna be a plastic thread screw or a very coarse thread like a wood screw. So I'm just gonna go ahead and move these up because they're gonna to have to pull a little bit. And next we can actually lift up on the mechanism and it's going to expose the mode select switch right here. We'll pop the top off just by lifting and gently pulling. And this one doesn't actually look too terribly bad. You zoom in on it just a tad, but as you can see, it is very oxidized. So we're going to hit it with the stainless toothbrush and scrub it up, clean it with some acetone and apply some more dielectric grease to it. One moment. Okay. Hopefully the focus is adequate here. So, I just want to go ahead and rough up all the contacts in this. And this is going to get down to a fresh coating of the silver plating that they used on these contacts. And it's going to make a mess. And I know that. And people have suggested other scrubbing methods, but I've had extremely good luck using uh, the uh, stainless toothbrush over the years. Like I've said in previous videos, I have some of these units that have been running for 30 plus years. Not these, obviously, because they weren't made 30 years ago, but other units that have been running for 30 plus years after this service on their mode select switches, Hitachis and Panasonics.
Okay, well, I certainly like that a lot better. I'm going to have to blow off some of the crud. Uh, some crud got into the uh, brush. Hard to see, but yeah, it's got crud built up in it. So next, acetone and a cotton swab. We'll wipe this out. Acetone will not eat the plastic on this type of switch. So that is a very good thing. And then we'll dry it off. And I'm going to say that looks better than when it left the factory. Very, very shiny, very nice. Now, there's a couple of schools of thought on this, and I like the mode select switch to have some rough edges because it's going to keep the contacts clean. They're going to have to try to self-clearance themselves over time, as the case may be. But like I said, very, very good luck using this method for 40 plus years. All right, so I have a bit of dielectric grease here. You can pick it up at your local auto parts store. I'm just going to go ahead and coat the inside of the mode select switch with a generous portion of dielectric grease. Just like that, it keeps oxidation away from the terminals. Uh, next, I need to go ahead and service the movable portion, which is basically done by just dragging the stainless toothbrush in one direction just to clean the contacts a tiny, tiny bit. And then I just want to wipe them off. Just like that, you should see definite shiny points on the switch. Just like that when you were done. Now sometimes I'll go ahead and I'll press with my thumbnail. See there's two little mounting tabs, so I'll press down with my thumbnail and then very gently lift up just a little bit on the contacts to give them just a tiny bit more uh, tension, as the case may be. I'm going to add just a bit of dielectric grease to the contacts. Next, we'll snap the two halves back together, just like that. And we'll run it around a bunch of times. That's going to help distribute the grease. Normally I speed this up, but a lot of people like these videos in real time, so I'm trying to oblige to those people. And I like that. Always make sure that when you're done that you line up this post right here with that dot on the circuit board, just like that. So while we've got it open right here, let's go ahead and wipe off the infrared emitter and the infrared emit uh, receiver for the rear rotation sensor since we are in this state right now. Okay, so here's a cotton swab uh, just moistened with regular household glass cleaner. And I just want to clean off the tip of the emitter and the tip of the receiver just so it has a clear view of the infrared signal and then I'm going to wipe off the tip of the emitter with the dry end as well as wiping off the receiver. Now I don't think that's going to be the problem honestly. I believe the problem is probably going to be the prism which lives up here on the top of the unit right there. You can see how nasty that is. Let's go ahead and try to get focus on that. There we go. Look how dirty that is. So any dust that accumulates on the outside of this prism actually disperses the, the light or the infrared beam 
so this will need to be completely cleaned I want it bright and shiny when it goes back together and so if you don't know what this does is as this reel turns you can see there's a hole right there and it basically blocks the light right there and then lets the light or the infrared signal shine through so it it makes and breaks the connection optically and the emitter transmits underneath the prism and the receiver lives under that hole so it knows basically if it sees the signal and then it blocks it and it sees it and it blocks it uh, written into the microprocessor is a program that basically says after a few seconds of not seeing the pulse go up and down up and down to stop the unit because it believes that this is not rotating and actually spilling the tape at that point okay so mode select switch has been serviced i need to put this thing back together which is done let's see if you can see it here uh this pin right there let's go ahead and put it back in auto focus that pin needs to go down in the center of the mode select switch i'm trying to do this while watching the monitor just like that so as long as you have the pin in the center of the mode select switch then the post of the mode select switch should be lined up if you timed it correctly so let's put this back together now okay back on the bottom of the mechanism remember the fine machine thread screw goes on the right hand side That also does provide a ground connection to the chassis mechanically, or electrically, I should say. And then the coarse thread screw that looks like that goes underneath the ribbon cable. Once again, being extremely careful to only apply as much torque as absolutely necessary on that ribbon cable. So it's going to get folded down and over like that so it doesn't occupy a lot of real estate. Always make sure that these are folded flat. That looks good. And then this one is the uh, audio control erase head, the full erase head. Okay, I'm pretty happy with those results. Uh, we need to service the prism next, which is quite easy to do. Remove the one screw. Hopefully you can see that in the prism. It was off camera. I'm sorry about that. The prism can be lifted out of the unit just like that. And then we'll get a close-up view on this. One moment. Okay, there's the prism before. You can see how dirty that thing is. So I've just got a paper towel with some glass cleaner on it. And I just want to wipe off basically the entire prism with glass cleaner to clean all the contaminants off of it. Now I'm probably going to have to take a cotton swab to get in the V groove on the top of it or on the left side of your screen. Sorry, the right side. My bad. A little dyslexia going on there. Okay, I'm liking that a lot better. We're going to go back to a dry portion. I want to dry everything off. And we'll take a look at it and make sure it looks nice and shiny. Well, certainly a lot better than when we started, that's for sure. Okay, let's put this thing back in. So there is where it goes. That's the emitter that I cleaned previously when I had the chassis up. And so it just locks into place. Make sure the holes are lined up. Keeps it from rotating.
There it is, mount her back down. Next, we can go ahead and service the power supply. And the main thing I wanna do is replace that problematic 4,700 microfarad 6.3 volt capacitor on the actual power supply board itself. So here is the power supply board. On uh, some of these, you wanna take a look and just look at the capacitors, make sure none of them are bulged. Um, I've had a rare occasion of one of these bulging and maybe that one right there. Mainly it's this filter cap right there, which is like I said, the 4,700 microfarad 6.3 volt cap that typically fails. I always replace them. These are Suscon, I do believe. Uh, I'm not seeing, um, oh, these are Intercon, I'm sorry. Uh, usually these are Suscon. Maybe the Intercons are better caps. Maybe they don't die as easily, but I typically replace these with Panasonic high temp 105 degrees Celsius caps because I think if you look at these, they are 85 degree, yes, you can see 85 degree Celsius caps. So it's gonna get replaced with a much higher quality cap that's gonna last many, many more years. Okay, so I've basically drawn a roadmap of the bottom view of all these capacitors with their values so I know what to look for. So I've got the ESR meter out here. Let's go ahead and make sure that the leads get zeroed out. I'm touching the leads together and I'll hit the zero button and we'll go ahead and ESR all of these capacitors. So 220, that's the main AC input filter cap. I see 0.37, I'm perfectly fine with that. This is a 10 at 16 and I see 1.7, 1.8, I'm okay with that. This is the main filter cap right here and I'm gonna check the pad first to make sure there's no connection because I have unsoldered one lead of the capacitor. And I do see 0 0.02, 0 0.03, it actually tests good. I'm still gonna change it to be safe. Once again, checking the pad first and capacitor value of 0.6 ohms on a 10 at 50. That is actually really good. Checking the pad, no conduction, and 0 0.06 on a 1000. I'm perfectly fine with that. Check the pad again, nothing, and the capacitor reads 0.14 on a 470. I'm okay with that. This is going to be a 1000 at 6.3 and it reads 0.1, just ever so slightly high in my book, but I think I'm gonna let it slide. Checking the pad on this one, a 470, and it reads 0.12, I'm okay with that on a 470. Checking the pad, and I am seeing 0.19, and I'm seeing that on the capacitor too. Oh. I bumped it, now the pad reads open. So 0 0.16, 0 0.17 on a 470, that is perfect. I think I checked this one already, 0 0.1 on a 1000, that's the one that's just ever, ever so slightly high. Checking the pad, no resistance, and the capacitor reads 0.5 ohms on a 22, that is great. These are both, both going to be 3300s, nothing on the pad and 0 0.03, 0 0.04, that is excellent. Nothing on the pad. And 0 0.05, I'm okay with that. Now these are 220s at 6.3. Typically these fail, they are in series. I only unsoldered one end. And 0.45, I'm okay with that. Nothing on the pad. And 0.67 on the 220, that checks out in my book. So, uh, basically, I want to go ahead and replace the main filter cap just because of the issues we had. And I think I'm going to ch check uh, a new 1000 at 6.3 and see what it reads like. One moment. Okay, so this is a brand new 1000. Let's zero the leads out. They're perfect. This is a Nichicon 1000 and it reads 0.3 ohms. And this one read 0 0.09. That must not be the one I was thinking of. Maybe it was this one. 
0.07, yeah, perfectly fine. My bad. All right, that'll be in the bloopers. Of course, the replacement cap hasn't been formed yet. Okay, let's just go ahead and replace that problematic force 4700 at 6.3. Unsoldered, it fell out. Brand new. Uh, I think this is a Panasonic going in. Make sure you get your polarity right. The negative always goes towards the dot. Make sure you have written down the positive and negatives based on the capacitor and not the silk screen. I've been burned by that too many times. All right, looks good. We'll trim the leads. Now this capacitor is probably gonna have a higher ESR than the original one did, just because it hasn't been used, it hasn't been formed yet. So as the capacitor gets used, the ESR typically goes down. So let's see what this one reads, 0 0.01, wow, which is excellent. And the original capacitor read 0 0.04. So definitely a much, much lower ESR capacitor going in than what came out of the unit. Okay, I think it's time to reassemble this unit and test the VCR again. I did check the brake, seems to be fine. I'm hoping the mode select switch just wasn't stopping the VCR at the right point. Okay, units all back together. Well, not all back, I don't have the back plate on here because I intend on checking all the capacitors on the DVD board over here. So caps have been replaced, or cap has been replaced, I should say. Power has been applied. And I do get dashes in the display up here on the front. You can just barely see it right there. Power on. Let's pop a tape into it. And we shall hit play. And obviously the remote batteries are dead in the unit. So we'll have to find the play button here. I think it's that one. And it is playing. Let's see if it plays more than about five to seven seconds. And we'll know if the real rotation sensor is working correctly or not. And I'm gonna say yes, it is working correctly. I do not have the capture device recording, but I do have the monitor connected and I do see good clear video on the screen. So we shall stop it and we will try to hit fast forward. I think that's it. And it works perfectly now. Remember it was binding before it wouldn't fast forward because I think the mode select switch did not know where the mechanism was and it was putting it in a bind with one of the brakes applied. Rewind. And I'm very happy with that. Uh, eject. Or play maybe. I can't really make out what the buttons are. So that's the DVD eject. Stop. Must have been pressing the wrong button. Okay, VCR mechanism is working perfectly. I love it. Let's go ahead and test the capacitors on the DVD board over here. 
and see if any of those are in need of replacement. Plus we'll go ahead and clean the optical pickup at the same time. Power has been removed. So just unplug these ribbon cables. And since I have the DVD mechanism just sitting here, I can just lift it out just like that. Okay, so here's the DVD board capacitor view and I've noticed that some of these units, especially the later ones, have better quality capacitors. They don't seem to fail as much as the earlier versions did. But let's just go ahead and test them all. That's a 330 and I get 1.1 ohms. Not too terribly bad for a surface mount. A 47 at 2.4. I'm willing to live with that. Another 47 at 6.3. 2.3 ohms. Fine. A 330. 0.3 ohms. I'm okay with that. These are all 330s, 0.8 ohms. That one's a little bit high for me. 0.3, good. 0.3, good. 1.3 ohms, I definitely want to replace that one. So I'm just gonna put a red mark on those two. Those are the ones I wish to replace. Whether the customer wants me to do it or not is going to be another story. A 47, 2.7 ohms, I'm okay with that. This is a 100 at 1 1.5 ohms. That one's a little suspect in my book as usual. It's not the end of the world though. This is a 100, 1 1.4, once again, a little high. See, I'd like to see that 0.5. I'd like to see 0.5. Remember, this is ESR, Equivalent Series Resistance. It's as if you put a resistor in series with one of the leads of the capacitor. 47 at 1.8, I'm okay with that. 330 at 0.3, that one's perfectly fine. Another 330, 0.6, 0 0.5, that's okay. 0.4 on another 330, now I had have had to replace these. These are 47s at 6.3. 2.3 ohms and 2.6. This is the last 47 at 2.5. Not too terribly bad. Um, I'm used to seeing these being defective at like 5 and 6 ohms, so I think I'm going to let those slide at 2.5 ohms. I think... Well, that one's okay at 447. And one ohm on that 330, I would like to replace that. So one, two, three of the 330s and two of the 100s, and all the rest seem to be perfectly fine. Uh, you know what? I'm just going to take a chance and go ahead and replace these guys. We'll service the optical pickup. Basically, just clean the optical pickup that lives up underneath here. And uh, we're just going to make this customer happy and hopefully get many, many more years on this unit. Now, as far as the fan goes, I think I've got a used fan that I'm going to just donate to the customer. I'm not going to charge for it. Uh, if I do have to order a new fan, of course, it will incur uh, the price of the fan plus shipping charges. But let's go ahead and get these capacitors changed. And we will move on at that point. Okay, so I'm trying to get the close-up view of this board, and I want to use what I call the twist-off method. Um, I don't know who invented this. I never saw it before, but this is the method that I devised and I use on most surface mount capacitors to get them off the board. I do have this in manual focus, so it shouldn't hunt too terribly much, but it just involves grabbing the capacitor with a pair of pliers. I know my hand's going to get in the way, so grab it. Squeeze it, push down very gently, and just rotate. And then it actually fatigues the leads of the capacitor, as you can see right there. And then it will just lift off of the board. I know my hand's right in the way. But just a couple of twists, and the capacitor is off of the board with no damage to the board. I don't think I've ever damaged a board using the twist off method. There might be another name for it, but this is the method that I devised, that I use. I've been doing it on camcorders and 
a lot of Mitsubishi DLP TVs for probably 25 plus years. And like I said, I've never ever damaged a board because of this. So I'm waiting for the soldering iron to warm up. We do need to strip the uh, capacitor leads that are remaining on the board off of the board. Okay, we are up to temperature. I like to use 800 degrees. Someone is definitely gonna get triggered by that. The YouTube comment generator is going to go amuck on this. 800 degrees, wow. You damaged the board, you should use 650, you know? Nah, it's okay. I'm gonna add fresh solder to one side. So these are the 100s that I'm using to replace them. These are Kemet 100s at 6.3. Now these do need to be bent down so they need to lay flat on the circuit board like that because there's not enough room to stand them up. So what I typically do is just give it maybe two or three millimeters and then fold the leads at a 90 degree angle. Keeping in mind the flat side of the uh, silk screen is the negative lead of the capacitor. And then I want to trim these leads with probably about a one millimeter gap. And because the leads on the board are a little farther apart than these are, I'm just gonna bend it out very slightly and we'll get my orientation correct here. And you're probably not gonna be able to see this because my hand is going to be in the way, but I have soldered one lead of the capacitor. There it is, I'm so sorry about that. So I've soldered one lead, the other one is just basically sitting there. I'm gonna apply solder to the second lead and then apply more solder to the first lead to make a good mechanical bond. Push that down and relieve the stress. So one capacitor has been installed and I will try, 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 try to get this one in the shot for everybody. This one is going to go in that orientation right there. So I give it basically two or three millimeters, bend it at a 90, and then line up the capacitor and I try to give it about a one millimeter gap. Same as last time. Bend the leads out just a little tiny bit. So that one lead has been attached. And I'm very happy with that result. I think that's gonna work out perfectly fine. Uh, yeah, real-time videos, you gotta love them, right? Okay, 3.30, so two of them right here and then one more way over there. Let's go ahead and tackle these first. Trying to get it up here where you might, well, probably not, but yeah. Twist off the capacitor, just like that. That one is off the board. And then we'll come over here to this one. These are all 330s. And I know my hand is definitely going to be in the way once again. And then that one is off the board. No circuit board damage whatsoever. Clean your pads. Fresh solder. Just wipe off the existing leads just like that. And then same thing over here. Those are off the board. And on these especially, I'm gonna add solder to just that one side. And this one will get laid flat, so it doesn't really matter what side. But I, I really want fresh solder on one side of the capacitors because 
these lay flat on the board. So what I need to do is orient it in this position. So what that means is I'm going to bend one of the leads. I'm sorry that it's out of focus. I'm going to bend one lead like that, and then I'm going to come out and bend the other lead in that fashion right there. Once again, give it about a one millimeter gap between the bottom of the capacitor and where you cut the lead off. And so we end up with a capacitor that looks like that. So I'm going to stand it up. Let me get the board into view. There we go. That's much better. So I'm just going to stand it up and attach the first lead that I tend, making sure the negative is on the flat side of the silk screen. Add fresh solder to that lead, let it cool, let it solidify, and fresh solder to that lead as well. And then we'll go ahead and do the other two capacitors. So I think I'm just going to cut away and come back when they're done. One moment. Okay, well, there it is. All the suspected defective capacitors have been replaced. And we are ready to go ahead and clean the optical pickup now. Everything else looks good on this board. All the other caps test acceptably. So let's go ahead and zoom out. We'll get this over here in position. I do have it on manual exposure because normally this washes out the picture and it makes it so dark if I don't. So to remove this cover on the DVD mechanism, it's just got these four tabs and you just got to really just press them over and then it lifts right on out like that. Let's move the optical pickup back, maybe. Uh, I think it's in a bind because I opened... There we go. Let's see if we can get this up. And it's still not completely up. One moment. Okay, well, there is the optical pickup, just with no light added. And then if I add some LED light to it, you can see how dirty it is. How did it even play a DVD in the first place? So I do have a cotton swab just moistened with household glass cleaner. Once again, I've said it a thousand times, nothing with ammonia because that can actually strip the optical coating off of the lens itself. Dry end rotating with minimal downward pressure, always clean in a circular pattern. Okay, optical pickup has been clean. Let's take another look at it with the LED light shining across it. And it certainly does look much better. I'm actually seeing possibly some buildup on the bottom of it. Let's do another quick wipe down. Maybe it was me. And yeah, I'm still seeing a little bit of buildup. Let's hit it with a bit of compressed air. And I think that's going to be as good as it gets, unfortunately. Okay, we'll put it back in the home position. Let's zoom out. Put the cover back on it. the brace back on it. And now we can go ahead and mount the circuit board back on it. I've never disconnected the optical pickup. When I do these units, I always leave them connected. Once again, for ESD discharge purposes. So these are the ground straps. 
that ground the case of the unit just to reduce RFI, EFI interference. Okay, I'm happy with that. Like I said, try to avoid disconnecting that cable unless you absolutely have to. This one's bent down pretty flat. I'm gonna stand it up. That way it gets a good contact. They're both bent down with the uh, mechanism. Well, let's throw this thing back together and give it a test. Okay, so off camera, I did go ahead and service the mechanism, clean the entire tape path, clean the pinch roller, all the guides, the uh, audio control erase head, the full erase head, uh, the back tension arm, the angle guides, the upper and lower cylinder, the video heads. You've seen me do it a thousand times, but I wanna go ahead and check the auto head cleaner to see if it's gonna be an issue in the future. So to check this thing, let's get a better view of it here. It's that little yellow disc Try to zoom in on it just a little tiny bit here until it defocuses. And then we'll come back until it is in focus. So I'm gonna put that right in the middle of the screen right there. So to check this thing and see if it's gonna be a problem is just grab it and give it a squeeze. And if it pops back perfectly round, then it's good. And if it pops back like that, then it is bad. So I'm gonna go ahead and just remove it from the customer's unit so that we don't have issues in the past, or in the future, I'm sorry. So basically, it's got this little tab right here. Just push in on the tab and then lift up on the whole assembly and it'll come out. That little tab is the only thing that holds it down. And what's gonna happen over time is this thing is going to get gummy. And when it gets gummy, it's going to gum up the works basically it has been used and it has been working in the past but because when you squeeze it it takes such a long time to respond it's on the short road to failure so I'm just gonna go ahead and take that out of there I'll return it back to the customer and let's go ahead and do a DVD to excuse me a VHS to DVD transfer uh, the mechanism is mounted I don't have the back on it yet, as you can tell, but I wanna make sure this thing is going to work before we go absolutely any farther. So let's get a tape ready and we will get the capture device set up and we'll do a transfer. All right, so I've got a blank DVD minus R in the drive right now. I'm gonna go ahead and close it. Now, I don't know what's going on with this thing not wanting to open, but there is no belt that drives the mechanism in this. It is direct drive. And I've had a couple of those. I think it just needs to be exercised and used periodically. When they sit, they seem like they don't want to open. But luckily on these units, you can actually open the drawer manually and you can like get your fingernail under this and help pull it out and exercise that grease this thing would be a nightmare to actually tear apart and try to repair. But look at that, it has figured out that it is a DVD minus R. And so I'm gonna set this record mode to one hour HQ mode, as you can see right there. I do have a tape of some home videos that I recorded back in, I think about 91 or 92. So it's gonna go in, I'm gonna let it find auto tracking, which it should start playing automatically. And it should be auto tracking at this moment. I think that is Washington DC, if I'm not mistaken. But I'm gonna go ahead and stop this. And I don't know what I need to do as far as setup goes, but we'll hit the setup button. Um, general setting. We'll set the clock and it is December 15th right now, 2023. We'll see if the clock goes that far. I'm not sure they thought these things were gonna last that long. And currently it is 1.48 in the morning as I'm staying up to get some of the stuff caught up for everybody. Okay, so that is done. We'll go back into setup. 
And oh, we're not in the DVD mode. No wonder I can't get into the DVD setup. So I'm going to set auto chapter to every five minutes. Auto finalize when disk is full on. Dubbing mode should be VCR to DVD and it is. Make recording compatible, whatever the heck that means, but yeah, make it compatible, fine by me. Uh, clock, we set the clock. So December 15th, 2023, it's 148 in the morning. And I don't think there's anything else that's for output, basically. Uh, nothing we need to do there. Playback, no, nah, everything's good. Okay, let's get out of this menu. And we shall hit the DVD, or excuse me, the VCR to DVD dubbing button. Because I do have the unit still apart. There is the D dubbing, so it should start dubbing automatically when i press that button here we go dubbing in three two one go uh nope not happening what is going on am i on the wrong button yes i am on the wrong button it's right Oh, okay. I was pressing a button on the board, but look at that. It presses this lower button right there. Okay, here we go. Three, two, one, dubbing. VCR to DVD dubbing says that it has begun. So we'll let this thing run and we shall see what happens. I'll be back in about an hour to check on it. And it shows it is recording. Okay, so on the one hour record test, I have one minute left, as you can see on the screen. And this is an Amtrak trip that I took across America in, I think, either 1991 or 1992. So I'm just curious what's going to happen when this thing finishes up. It's one hour VHS to DVD <laughs> dubbing copy. I do have the display up on the screen. That way I can actually see the time remaining. And now it is zero minutes, so that means it has, well, basically one minute left until it's finished. Okay, there it is, it has finished. So it's going to hopefully write the data to the disk and then possibly finalize the disk on its own. And if it doesn't, I will have to manually force a finalize on the disk. So far, everything's working great. Hopefully it finishes the finalization. So I'm going to speed this up and then we'll cut back to it when it's finished. Okay, well, I didn't actually speed it up. It went to 100% very quickly after that. So we'll see what happens. There it goes. It's finalizing. I will speed this part up because it takes like five minutes. One two, three, four, five moments. Okay, well, I think it is actually done. So I'm gonna go ahead and open the drive if it will let me. And it did. We'll close the drawer once again and see if it reads the table of contents and can play back the disc. So far, everything looks very encouraging. And yes, it did actually play back the disc. 
well, it found the table of contents at least. And there it is playing back the disc. Let's go ahead and skip forward a couple of chapters. And we'll turn off this display on the screen. There it is working perfectly. Um, yeah, I'm going to say that's it. I'm going to put this thing back together and get it ready to get sent back to my customer who lives down in the San Francisco Bay area, I believe around Burlingame, California. Okay. So that's it. It's working perfectly. Mode select switch capacitor and the power supply just as a preventative measure and repairing, uh, the capacitor, replacing the capacitors in the DVD mechanism, cleaning the optical pickup as well as the VHS mechanism. That's going to be it. Thank you for watching. I really do appreciate it. You, you can leave me a question, a comment, a concern down below, good or bad. Uh, try to respond to the comments when I have time while you're down there. If you could, please hit that subscribe button and like this video, ring the bell, blah, 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 all that stuff. Um, you can follow me on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter at NorCal715. You can email me NorCal715videos at gmail.com. As of right now, please contact me on the comments on one of my YouTube videos. I check the comments periodically. I have not had much time to check the emails in quite a while. Uh, the best way to contact me, once again, leave a comment on one of the videos. Remember, with your help, we can try to keep these things out of the landfill, out of the recycle bin, and out of the e-waste facility. Everyone, thank you for making it to the end of this video. Once again, I really, really appreciate it. Everyone, have a great day. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. And yes, I did manage to find out of a virtually new old stock defective unit, a brand new fan, like no dust, no dirt. I've went ahead and installed it on the customer's back panel right here. And so here is the customer's fan. And I think this thing just has a little bit of bearing wobble because it's probably, yeah, it's got a little bit of wobble. It's uh, most likely not ball bearings, but sleeve bearings. So uh, probably going to try to find a couple of these on uh, uh, the Jungle website or the eBay. I'm not sure. Uh, just to have them in stock for future use. But yeah, this is the noisy one. Of course, it sounds good now because I've been messing with it. But anyhow, there is the new fan installed. Okay, here is an audio sample of the replacement fan. The new old stock, very low hour fan. And I'm probably an inch and a half away. And I can barely hear anything. And the microphone is barely picking up anything as well. So I think that's gonna be it. The unit is repaired. I'm very happy with this repair. I think this thing is gonna give this customer several more years of use. Everyone, thank you for watching. I really, really appreciate it. Have a great day. Bye-bye. All right, let's get the top off, take a look inside and see what it actually does before I power this thing up. Okay, here we go. Capture device running in three, two, one, capture. And it shows it is recording. And I should have stopped the capture device, but I did not because I'm a dumb arse. Stop. Okay, capture device running in three. Well, let's start a new segment then. Okay, capture device running in three, two, one, capture. And it shows that it is recording. One moment. Okay, here we go. Capture device running in three, two, one, capture. Okay, here we go. Capture device running in three, two, one, capture.
Thanks for watching. Everyone have a great day. Bye bye. Check, check, one, two, three. And there is a sampling of the audio from the new fan. Basically, whisper quiet. And I put the microphone right up to it. I think that's the wind noise blowing past the mic. But from a couple of inches away, it is perfectly quiet. All right, that's it. This thing is fixed. I'll get it ready to ship back to my customer very soon. Everyone have a great day. Thank you so much for watching. Bye-bye. All right, let's take that fan again. But anyhow, there is the new fan installed.